Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise While the hope of endless glory Fills my heart with joy and love. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure save me to arrive at home jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of god he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a debtor, find my wandering heart to Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Clothed in the blood washed linen, how I'll sing thy wondrous grace. Come, my Terry, take my ransom soul away. Send my angel soon to carry me to realms of endless day. Greetings. So glad you're tuning in. I uh, pray that God's word will uh, give you comfort, give you strength, and and help you to overcome your mountains. And um, remember to subscribe, uh, share this video with a friend or family member, and may you be encouraged by his word. Please join me for prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for being a good God. And we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And through his words that we learn, that we grow, that we can walk closer to you. Lord, as we all face mountains, uh, we ask that you will give us, give us faith and that you will teach us how to move them and that we will trust in your promises. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, what abound in your desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Your name, with the sun shining down on me, the world's 
all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. confession and absolution. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen. Upon this your confession, I have reversed my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 11. Because the Lord revealed their their plot to me, I knew it. For at that time, he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut, cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But you, Lord Almighty, who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, Let me see your vengeance on them. For you I have committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from James chapter 4. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 9. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum when he was in the house and asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way... They had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right, so glad you can uh, join us. Um, 
We are blessed that you can visit us online, um, wherever you are throughout the world. Uh, it God richly bless you. And uh, greetings from us to you from San Francisco. And uh, remember to hit subscribe. And if there's a sermon that really speaks to you, remember to share it with your friends. Um, and if you're ever in San Francisco, come visit us uh, here, um, 495 9th Avenue, San Francisco, California. And our, right now, currently, our service times are at, uh, at 10 a.m. All right, let's start with this one. One time, there was a flight, a passenger flight, an airplane uh, full of passengers. They were ready to take off. But there was this five-year-old child who decided to throw a big temper tantrum. So everything was going smoothly, except when this child decided to throw a temper tantrum, everybody's attention turned to that child. Well, the mother was so embarrassed that she tried everything she could to calm the child down. Unfortunately, the child did not want anything to do with it. He kept kicking the, kept screaming and kicking the, um, the you know, the chairs, I mean, the seats, and, uh, and finally, as he's doing this, there is this Air Force general from way behind the aisle. He started walking to the front of the aisle. When he got there, he tapped the mother on the shoulder, and he leaned over, and he pointed to his uh, uniform. You know, he was a retired Air Force general. He was in uniform, and he pointed to his uh, uniform. Then he whispered something in the child's ears. Well, right away, the child quiet down. He held his mother's hand, and he buckled up. Then the, the retired general uh, turned around and started back towards his seat. Well, the crowd <laughs> went into spontaneous applause. The, you know, he saved the day, basically. As he was going back to his seat, a flight attendant tapped the man, and he said, Sir, what magical words do you say to that little child that got him to calm down? All the Air Force general said, well, I, I showed him my wings, my combat ribbons, my medals, and I told him that it entitles me to throw one person out of any flight of my choosing. <laughs> Friends, I mean, uh, we're on uh, chapter 3 of I Am a Church Member by Thomas Rayner. And in it, he talks about sometimes uh, believers have an attitude sometimes. Now, I mean, they, they, we're not going to throw, we're not going to say it, they'll throw themselves on the ground, but sometimes their demands are like children. The force of their demands and what they want, it's like children. They want what they want. One time, Jesus uh, and his followers, they were on their way back to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, if you visit ancient Capernaum, or, I mean, Capernaum today, um, you would see a sign that says, Jesus Town, okay? The reason is Jesus was born in Nazareth. That was his hometown. But Capernaum was his uh, headquarters. In fact, that's where they found the house of Peter. Peter had moved there. So Jesus established his headquarters there. It was there that he did most of his miracles in that area. And so they were traveling back to headquarters, and then the disciples got into a me-first fight. I'm better than you. When Jesus becomes king, I deserve to rule more land than you. I'm better than you. I can preach a better sermon than you. More people respond to my message than your messages. Look at all the demonic people I delivered. Look, look at this severe case. I was able to do it. You weren't. Look at all the things I've done. They were fighting and they were arguing over me first. I'm first. I'm better than you. Well, you know, this kind of reminds me of a, a mother one time. Um, she was cooking pancakes for breakfast to her, for her two kids. And um, their older son uh, was named um, Kevin. Younger son was named Ryan. 
Well, I'm sure they were hungry, so mom is preparing pancake. And they were fighting over who would get the first pancake. Well, the mother saw this as a teaching moment. And then the mother said to both of them, sons, this is what Jesus would do. You have the first pancake, I can wait. Well, the older one, Kevin, had a bright idea. His eyes lit up. He turned to his brother, little brother Ryan, and said, you be Jesus. Can you imagine that? These disciples are fighting me first. And then Jesus says to them, what were you guys arguing about? Well, of course he knew. He wanted them to acknowledge or tell him about it, but they remained silent. Finally, when they got to Capernaum, Jesus brought them together, and he said, Mark 9, 35, he said, sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He says, if you want to be first, you want to be number one, you have to be last. You have to let everybody go before you. And then you must be servant of all. By the way, the New Testament alone, the New Testament, the word servant, the noun servant is recorded 57 times. Now, I, I know it at times it refers to somebody who has a role in the family, a hired servant or, or you know, a servant of the family. But it's also listed as a verb 58 times. So you get the picture. When the word of God is repeated, when that word is repeated over and over again, 50-something times, it means that servanthood is really important. Jesus said, Unless you want to be first, you have to choose to be last and servant of all. Uh, this is what Billy Graham said. Billy Graham said, unless our belief in God causes us to help our fellow man, our faith stands condemned. What I think he's saying is this. Until our faith moves us to start serving and helping people, then our faith is condemned, meaning it is meaningless. The outsiders, the non-believers will look at us believers as you guys don't have it together. You guys don't know what you really believe in. So the first point I want to make is it's not about me. It's not about me. Ironically, what Jesus said is if we continue to want things to go our way, then the happiness that we receive from that is only temporal. Paradoxically, when we choose to be last and serve, then we'll have this lasting joy. It's not about me. Um, in my last church, um, many years ago, I remember when I you know, first arrived, first year or two, it's just kind of getting to understand the lay of the land. Um, my church was situated in the Mission District of Fremont. Now, the Mission District is the richest district, okay? Um, it became like that because immigrants, you know, we had rich immigrants. Well, where, where do you get rich immigrants? Well, what happened was, or it's still happening now, that the Silicon Valley um, tech companies were hiring all these engineers from India, China, Taiwan. and and so they moved to Fremont and they wanted to be in the Mission District because Mission High School was the top 100 high school in, in the United States. And so to get their kids in the prestigious school, they moved to the Mission District, which drove, which drove up the prices of homes and it became a very prestigious place to be. Well, our church was there. We were there before all of this happened. And so I saw this, we, you know, we saw this as an opportunity to share the good news with so many of these immigrants. The situation is, however, at the time was, we tried a lot of things, but unfortunately, one of the hindrances was our worship time was at 9 a.m. 
We had two congregations in, in, on our property. We had the death congregation, uh, which met at 1030. And so as we were discussing this, you know, we finally, I worked with the leadership, we finally felt that this, was, this would be for the betterment of the congregation because nine o'clock is not good for young families with children. And so finally we made the decision, um, you know, I made the announcement and unfortunately there were a few people that were visibly upset and they left the church. Well, there was a couple who, who, you know, who were there for many years, they left. However, as they were talking to other people, those people invited them to talk to me. And so finally we had a time to talk and they said to me, Pastor, I felt that what you said rubbed me the wrong way. It felt like you didn't care about me. When I said, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean I don't care about you. And then they started to explain that by changing the church service, it interrupted their schedule in that we used to met at nine, service ended at 10. They had a, they had a bluegrass group that played at 10.30. And so by moving the service time, it messed it up their schedule. Of course, they ended up going to a different church in town that had an earlier service within a year they retired to Minnesota. While the change allowed many more people to visit the church, and uh, we were able to share good, the good news with many more people. We had many more young families uh, join the church. But this couple made it about them. Jesus says, it's not about you. If you want to be first in the kingdom, you got to be last. You got to be willing to serve. It's not about rights. It's about our preferences. It's about the willingness to serve. St. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Aren't those sound advice? Don't look only at your interests but look at the interests of others. The author of our book, Thomas Rayner, wrote, and this is in chapter three, he wrote, quote, but the strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up your preferences when you join. Don't get me wrong. There may be much about your church that you like a lot, but you are there to meet the needs of others. You are there to serve others. You are there to give. You are there to sacrifice. How true. It's not about me. It's about giving and putting others first. Point number two, it's about putting others first. I came across this uh, Chinese proverb, um, and it goes like this. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. Pretty true, huh? Let's break it down. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. Well, sometimes we're, we're crummy. You know, we have a bad attitude. Why? Because didn't get enough sleep. We're tired. So take a nap. And it says you'll be happy for an hour. How about fishing? Well. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. Oh, well, maybe that's why my dad loves fishing. He's retired, he has the time. Um, you know, fishing can be fun, very relaxing. You wanna be happy for a day, do it. But if you wanna be happy for a year, re receive an inheritance. Well, I doubt many of us can do that, okay? For a year, but you notice, you notice the happiness with napping, fishing, Inheritance, those are all temporal. But then the last part, if you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. Doesn't this kind of sound familiar? Jesus said, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who love, those who live for themselves will lose it. 
Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my, because my servant must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Notice this is another, it's the book of John and it's about servanthood again. Now what he's really saying is that a lot of, when we are doing these temporal things so that we can be happy, you'll be constantly searching, what's the next thing that will make me happy? But if you want true happiness, don't make it about you. Put others first. Um, as I was preparing, I came across an article and it's called Volunteering, Seven Big Reasons Why Serving Others Serves Us. Basically, the article is about how volunteering, how serving will benefit us. Okay. It's by Kathy Gottberg, and she is a, a blogger, living365.com, if you want to check out her work. And she lists seven things. Longer lifespan. People who volunteer have a longer life. They said based, she said, based on 40 international studies, it's confirmed that it adds years to your life. It also says there are 22% reduction in mortality rates. How many hours do you have to do? 25 in a year. That's not a lot of time. If you put in 24 hours in a year, you will live longer. Wow. The next thing, lower blood pressure. They found out, they, so a study done by Psychology and Aging, the reports that adults over 50 who volunteered for 200 hours in a year, in the past year, were 40% less to have hypertension lower blood pressure and then a mild a reduced mild depression reduced mild depression so they followed those who went to AA meetings they found that those who volunteered stayed clean longer and maybe it's because volunteering kept them in, in a community in connection with people which helped them and served as their support system Another one, more happiness. Everybody wants to be more happy. According to uh, Stephen, you know, Stephen G. Post, professor of preventative medicine at Stony Brook University in New York, he wrote a book called The Hidden Gifts of Helping. He said a part of our brains light up when we help other people. Then he talks about the chemicals, the dopamine, uh, serotonin, that, that you know, are chemicals our body produces these happy chemicals when we begin helping people. And it says that it helps us to have greater happiness, reduce stress. They also found that when someone volunteers to help others, the body releases a hormone called oxytocin. oxytocin. And um, it just reduces stress. Relief from pain. A study by, done by Pain Management Nursing. They reported that people from a scale of zero to 10 describing their pain, those who were leading, well, they said their pain was at the level six, but those who started leading a group, volunteering, helping people, say that their pain level dropped to four. Maybe it's because when we're doing something good, we forget about our own pain, and so they say their, level, their pain was at level four. And finally, it's a benefit to your career in that, well, if you're volunteering, you're doing, you're serving, you're helping people, you're doing good, you feel good about yourself. When you go to work, you are a better person. It's not about me. It's about putting others first. It's also about an attitude of having the attitude of Jesus. Dave Thomas, uh, those of us who live in America, we know about the Wendy's burger chain. Uh, the founder is uh, Dave Thomas. Now, he's considered a self-made millionaire, which also means that uh, he didn't start out with anything, OK? 
okay? In fact, he didn't even get a high school diploma. He went back to school later to get his GED. Now, oftentimes we would see him in these television commercials uh, with uh, uh, work, you know, his apron, <laughs> you know, his work dress. Um, the truth is David, Dave never finished high school. Long before he went to Wendy's, he worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken. From the low level, he, walked, he worked all the way to the top. Um, and he said, I got my MBA long before I got my GED. At Wendy's, MBA does not mean Master of Business Administration. It means market, mop, bucket, attitude. The mop, the bucket, attitude. For him, he taught service comes before success. Service comes before success. Does that sound familiar? You can turn to Philippians 2, 3 to 8. Paul wrote, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And then Paul talks about the attitude. It's about having the attitude of Jesus. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, verse 5. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You notice Jesus was God. He still is God, but he never claimed it as something to gloat about. He never took advantage of his position as God. Instead, he humbled, voluntarily humbled himself. God became one of us. Here is God who is infinite. He took on the form of a human being, born of the virgin, born into this world, so that he could serve, suffer, and die on the cross for us. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The attitude of Jesus is one of humbleness and service. On the evening before Jesus was arrested, and uh, this is just fitting again, he was having his last supper, okay? In the upper room uh, with, you know, in the room of uh, owned by the house owned by John Mark, they were having their last supper. Everything was prepared. Well, as they were having their, you know, while they were there, the disciples had another me first fight. Don't they get it? They still didn't. In fact, again, the argument they were going on, well, when Jesus comes into his king, when he becomes king, I need, I'm first. I need to rule over more places because I'm better than you. Me first. No, no, I'm better than you. I do this better than you. No, I've done more. Well, where were you when this happened? The me first argument. Well, Jesus doesn't say anything. I don't know about you, but if you, were, if you know your time was short and people are fighting, and, uh, wouldn't you just go over there and slap them and say, hey, knock it off. You know, my time is short here. I want to cherish the time I have with you. No, Jesus does not correct them. Instead, he took the posture of a servant. He went over, took a basin. He wrapped a towel around his waist. He filled the basin with water. One by one, he went over and washed his disciples' feet. Instead of teaching them, he taught them by his action. He showed them what it meant to be a servant. One by one, he washed their feet. Now, think about this. These 30 feet that walk the dusty roads, these roads where animals traveled, where there was dust and manure and dirt, one by one, he washed their feet. Here's the creator of the universe. He becomes a human being. In fact, they should be washing his feet because he's the master. He is God, but God himself kneels down 
and washes the dirty feet of his 12 disciples. Didn't they get it? No, they didn't understand. Jesus showed them what it meant to be last, what it meant to serve. One by one, the creator washed the feet of the created, the filthy, dirty feet of his disciples. It's a story, it's an image that what Jesus would do is die on the cross for all of their sins. If you want to be first, Jesus said, you must be last and be the servant of all. In the 19th century, um, they considered in the 19th century, um, the Billy Graham of the 19th century was um, D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody. Um, you know, I've referenced him a few times. Now, he's known for bringing millions of people to Jesus, uh, his work, his preaching. One time, he was having a um, conference in uh, Massachusetts, and he had his guests, people were from these uh, church leaders from Europe were coming to his conference. Well, in Europe, they had a, um, they had a, I wouldn't say a process, but a practice back then that the guests would leave their shoes out in the hallway and they would have servants would come in Europe, they would, they would like clean their shoes. Well, in America, we don't have that practice. When, when the guests arrived and they put their shoes out there, Dwight went up and looked and he saw all these shoes. He told his, he talked to his uh, students. The students looked at him and some said they were busy, others didn't say a word. Well, later on in the evening, um, Moody took all the shoes and into his room. One by one, he began to clean their shoes, wipe them down, clean them. Nobody knew about this until one of his friends uh, just decided to pop in and, and to talk to him. And they saw him shining and cleaning the shoes of all of his guests. Well, the next morning, the guests woke up, you know, from Europe. You know, they expected this. They had clean shoes. They don't know who cleaned them. That day, that day, his friend talked to his students. And one by one, they learned. And so every evening, someone would volunteer and clean the shoes of their guests. One of the reasons why Moody was great in the kingdom of God is because he knew the attitude of Christ Jesus. He began serving by cleaning shoes. My dear friends in Christ, it's not about me. Church is not about me. Being a Christ member is not about me. It's about putting others first. It's about having the attitude of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you want to be first in the kingdom, you must be last and servant of all. Amen. May God richly bless you. Please join me for prayer. Lord, we know there are times when, you know, we just look out for ourselves. You know, we forget that, you know, we belong to you and to your body. There are times when all we think about is ourselves, Lord. Help us to just refocus and have the attitude that you had when you came to this earth. Help us to be willing to serve. Help us to see the need to serve. Help us to know that it is not about us, but it's all about you and your glory. Lord, we uh, lift up all of these concerns we have into your hands. The, the world, as we continue to struggle with COVID-19, we ask for your protection. We also ask that you will grant our government, our leaders, the president of our nation, wisdom to continue to help us navigate these difficult times. We also ask for your protection upon um, your people, people who believe in you throughout the world, that you will protect them from violence and protect them from this virus. We also lift up our firefighters who are still putting out these wildfires. We ask for weather, cooperating weather. We thank you that it's coming on Sunday. And Lord, we thank you so much for just loving us and being there for us, especially when we need it. Lord, thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.